Amen. Would you raise your hands with me this morning? The presence of God is here. And it's not something we take lightly. <laughs> Thank you, God, that you are here, that you are close. And you are a God that wants to meet us this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and empower and inspire and breathe on every heart and every mind in this room. God, I pray that you would come to life through your word, that you would reveal yourself in new ways, but spirit full. We want more of you, God. I pray through this message, God, may hearts be open towards you, may eyes be turned towards you once again. We pray for a church that is an all-in people for Jesus, an all-in kingdom people. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to take your seats. Young people, what a weekend we had. It was summer camp last week and it was absolutely phenomenal. We have not stopped receiving testimonies of what God has done last week. We, we asked a few of our young people what was your favorite part of camp? And one person said, I met with Jesus and I didn't get any sleep. That was camp in an absolute nutshell. We were running on one hour of sleep for five days. It was unbelievable, but it was the best time ever. Young people, didn't we meet with Jesus? There was encounter, there was surrender moment. It was a phenomenal weekend. And I wanna thank, I know that Chris said it already, but every single person involved could we have a round of applause for everyone who served? This is kingdom building. Young people were at the feet of Jesus last week. That is no small thing. And, and as, as you know, church, we had the privilege of hosting some Ukrainian um, students through Bishop Luffer. They came along to summer camp. Some of them came for the whole time. And it was amazing to see them. One girl was translating. Um, it, it was amazing to host them, to have them with us. And, and one evening I was sat with one of the girls um, outside and she was telling me um, her life, uh, these past few months of war, of, of what had happened to her. And I'd never heard anything more horrific or surreal in my whole life. It was unbelievable speaking to her, but at, at the end she said, but being here, I've never felt more like a normal, loved teenager in my whole life. That is incredible. That is incredible. She'd never felt more like a normal teenager in her whole life. What an opportunity to show the love of God. What an opportunity to show these young people glimpses of the kingdom. It was incredible. And young people were at the feet of Jesus. That is the beautiful kingdom. As many of you may know, I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm a church girl through and through. I've been coming to church my whole life, been surrounded by the environment my whole life. I gave to my life to Christ um, at a very young age. But uh, three or four years ago, after a conference, um, there was kind of a wrestle going on in my heart, in my spirit. It's as if God had not quite finished something in me. There was a wrestle in my heart. And it's as if God, is, God had his hand placed on an area of my heart that said, is this mine yet? Is this piece of, if, if this piece of your heart mine yet? There was a wrestle going on in my spirit and the weight had pulled me to my knees. And God said very clearly, are you mine? It was as if some parts of my life were still dipped in the world, as if a foot was still dipped in the world. And he said, are you mine? Are you in? Are there parts of your heart that are still not mine yet? And in that moment, it was a re-surrender moment. It was an anchor moment in my life where God said, are you in? It was a re-surrender moment of parts of my heart that were not yet his yet. And perhaps 
you've, you've been coming to church for a long time as well, and, and you know the ins and outs, you know the teachings, you, you know it all, but, but maybe there's a wrestle in the heart as well. Are you in? Are you mine? Maybe he's saying, or perhaps you're new. This is one of your first times coming, and there hasn't been that, that quite surrender to God yet. Does a re-surrender need to occur? There were still parts of my heart stuck in sin and regret. There were still parts of my heart stuck in areas that needed a bit of validation, and I was looking in the wrong places. Does a re-surrender need to occur? There is always a fight for the heart, for its attention, for its affection. Does there need to be a re-surrender? Our passage today comes from First Kings. We looked at this at Summer Camp Youth, but we're going to go into it a bit deeper today. It's after the prophet Elijah receives divine direction from God in a gentle whisper. And God directs him to go back the way he came and appoint Elisha, his successor, as the new prophet. We pick up 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 to 21. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my mother and father goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah said, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burnt the plowing equipment to cook the meat and give it to the people and they ate. Then they set out, then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So just as God had said, Elijah set out and found Elisha. He was working the ground, preparing it for a planting. And Elijah goes up to him and throws a cloak on him. And Elisha, in an instant, he knew what that meant. This was no small passing moment in his life. In that moment, as he received the mantle, he knew that there was a resignation of his life up until that point. A resignation of all his life up until that point. He knew that this meant leaving everything and following this call. He knew that this meant leaving everything and following the one who called him. He knew that this meant leaving comfort and desire and plan and way and following the one who called. He knew that this would cost him everything. So Elisha goes back, not cowering away, but in full confidence to burn his plows. If we stay here for a moment and realize what this is, burning of the plows meant burning everything, his whole life, what it was built upon, burnt to the ground. He'd slaughtered his oxen. There was no way of return. It was a burning of the life that he was living. And he kissed his father and mother goodbye. And this time, this was called the kiss of allegiance. It was a kiss saying, this was then, but this is now. It was where his allegiance and his priority now lied. But the very fact that Elisha had the power and the authority to burn these plows and own them to start with, meant that he was a man of great success, of great status, of great wealth. There's an image of, of what it would have been like. The very fact that he owned this was great success, great wealth. And as these oxen, there wasn't two, there was 12 pairs, there was 24 oxen before him. And as, as he was there driving the 12th pair, it's as if his plan and desire were lined up before him. Yet in a moment, he burnt it all to follow the one who called. It meant he had servants and a household and money and wealth, but in a moment, he burnt it to the one who called. He made a resignation of his life up until that point, and he said, I am all in. His action was, I am all in. 
And I think in every, in every life, something needs to be burned. What needs to be burned? Like Elisha, it was plan and path. It was desire and it was way. But maybe it's a plan A. The plan A that is the just in case this whole God thing doesn't work out. Perhaps it's the plan that's the good plan, but not the God plan. Perhaps it's, it's past and it's sin, that the plows are still there. We keep coming back to it. In that case, the burning of the plows is repentance moment. We don't burn the plows of sin, but it's, a, it's an action of repentance. You see, Elisha, he burnt it and he turned towards the one who called. Repentance is a turning moment, coming to the cross and saying, I'm sorry, and receiving fresh forgiveness, fresh love, fresh grace. It's a repentance moment. It's a turning, saying, I'm not going back there. Burning the plows, the opportunity to even go there. It's a repentance moment. Maybe burning the plow is burning up areas that we have accepted in the past. Compromise means the acceptance of things that are not quite what is desired. So in our case, accepting things that are not quite what God desires. It is not a desire that needs to be reached or worked to or strive to. It's simply a desire that we need to surrender into. But what are the things that we've been accepting in this past formal life of the world? Where has there been acceptance that, that we haven't burnt the plow, so it's something we keep coming back to? We, the church, the people of God, are called to be all in people. We're called to be the burning of the plows people and all in for the kingdom people. What is there that we've been accepting? I want what I accept to be kingdom. I want what I accept to be him. Burning the plows of compromise. And what I find fascinating is that Elisha didn't have to burn the plows. Never once did it come out of Elijah's mouth that he had to burn the plows or slaughter his oxen. Maybe Elijah was just expecting a yes, that's fine. Or yeah, I can do that. Or I can do that on that day. I can follow, but on the weekend. But Elisha burnt the plow because it was an all-in action. It's the identification of compromise, of relationships, of acceptances, of burning the plows that said, I am kingdom person. I am all-in kingdom person. Young people, what does burning the plow look like? Burning the plow of compromise. It means going back to school in September and saying, this is the life that I was a part of, but this is the kingdom that I'm part of now. In the New Testament, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is speaking to a ruler, a rich, rich man. And this man says, I've done everything right. The scripture will come up behind me. I've done everything right. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be in the kingdom? And Jesus, it says, looks on him and loves him and simply says, one thing you lack. Take everything you have, give it away and follow me. And it says that the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus here is not saying that we must burn everything and give it away, live under the stars. Jesus here was simply putting a hand on this man's heart and saying, is this mine yet? Jesus was just identifying this man's plow. And what I find fascinating is that Jesus doesn't bargain with this man. Jesus doesn't, doesn't bargain with this man. There's no negotiation. There's no Jesus saying, come back, come back. I didn't mean it. 
come back. You don't have to sell it all. What is stunning and what is beautiful is that Jesus pursues and loves because he wants it all. He didn't bargain for scraps and pieces. He pursues because he wants it all. He wants it all. He wants, he wants to be ruler of all. What does burning the plow look like? It means surrendering plan and stepping into his. What does burning the plow of desire look like? Giving over desire and will and picking up his. What does burning the plow look like? This is my life then, but I pursue holiness now. What does burning the plow look like? I don't step foot in those environments anymore. It may look like stepping out of friendships. Friendships that are making us compromise things for the kingdom. But the call is all in, just like Elisha's call, it was an all in call. It's an all in call. The kingdom is full and the benches are wide. The food piled high, the welcome great, but it is an all in kingdom. It's not a pick and choose. It's an all in kingdom. It's a privilege of an all in kingdom. Come taste and see is the invitation. And the kingdom, thank God, is not an in and out visitation with the king, but is privilege of an all in with the king. In the burning of the plow moment, in the surrender moment, Elisha didn't just burn the plows, but he was given a mantle. But it's the mantle that made him burn the plow. Not only was there a turning and a surrender of his plan, but there was a picking up of the mantle. He burnt the plow, but he was clothed with the call. For Elisha, Elijah placing the mantle on him was come. Come and receive prophetic anointing. The mantle means come and see what a life with God looks like. The mantle means chosen. The mantle means come and see what I do. The mantle means come and see, come and point to Jesus. The mantle means come follow. Elisha, it cost him everything for the mantle. He was robed with the call. It meant come follow me and it meant come and serve. Thanks. You keep it. (laughs) He gave it all for the mantle, for the call, for the anointing, for the choosing. The mantle said come and serve. Verse 21 of our passage says that Elisha followed Elisha, Elijah. He set out to follow Elijah as a servant. So he burned it all to be a servant. There was no single moment of what is my gain. He burned it all to be a servant. My grandfather's uncle was called Fernando Vangioni. What name? And he was the the son of a single mum. But uh, as a teenager, he felt a very intense call and fire to serve God. It was like his mantle moment. It was like his surrender moment. And he followed. So he left everything and he followed. And he did what was before him. And in that moment, there was a very old evangelist in Argentina He was so old that after every single one of his messages from being stood up, he had pain in his feet and they were swollen. So this man came to every single one of his messages, came alongside his ministry, and after every message, he got on his knees and he massaged his feet. He gave it all 
to be a servant. Now in the eyes of the world, that doesn't look like success to a lot of people. To massage the feet of an old evangelist does not look like success, but kingdom success. In the eyes of the kingdom, that was greatness. Worldly success will never look like kingdom success. World greatness and world promotion will never look like what what it looks like to the kingdom. World success is never going to look like kingdom success, but it's worth burning any plow for. Elisha burned everything to be a servant. And for a lot of his ministry, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. That's what he was known for, the man that poured water. Yet after the life of Elijah, his first miracle as a prophet was a pouring of water. It says in 2 Kings, this is after Elijah is gone, the people of the city said to Elisha, look our Lord, this town is well situated as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring, threw salt into it, and said, this is what the Lord says. I've healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha has spoken. The very faithfulness and obedience of Elisha meant a life of servanthood but a life of blessed and great servanthood because God took him to greater, not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the kingdom. Maybe it's the fact of being in that place of servanthood, the privilege of being a servant of God, that's what the mantle is. Giving it all to be a servant. Being in the place of massaging feet, or stacking chairs, or speaking to clients, or chatting to parents, being in the place of servanthood. Is that worth burning any plow for for you? Later in 2 Kings, people are inquiring about who this Elisha man was. And they said, that's Elisha, son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. That was was who he was known as. Could it be that we are called to be a people, the kingdom people that gave it all to pour pour water on the hands of the king? Could it be that we are a kingdom people who give it all and burn the plows to be a people that simply serve God? In the eyes of the world, that is no greatness, but in the eyes of the kingdom, that is greatness. It's worth burning any power for. It is greatness in the eyes of God. Should we stand, church, as the band come up? It says in Luke 9, Jesus is talking with a man. And he says, follow me. And this man says, but let me go back. Let me sort this out. And in verse 62, Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. No one who puts a hand to the call of God but has something to look back to. No one who steps into kingdom but has something to look back to. Would we be a people that are all in for the kingdom? All in for servanthood. It's worth burning any plow for. There's another call in the Bible that I turn to when there's discouragement, when I slip up. And it's the call of Matthew. Matthew is sat 
in a tax collector's booth. He had aligned himself with the Roman Empire. He was disowned by his family, most probably. He had abandoned his people. He was a thief and he was hated. But Jesus walks past, I believe it's no accident, walks past in that moment and he looks, he knew who he was looking for. And he says to Matthew, come follow me. And I picture his disciples saying, are you kidding? You want to associate yourself with that man, with the thief? And Jesus says, follow me. And I picture Matthew thinking, me, me, the thief, the one rejected, me. And Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew gets up out of the tax collector booth and follows. And never once again in scripture does it say that Matthew returned to the tax collector booth. And I believe because he tasted and he'd seen what a life with Jesus looked like. Because he tasted sweet forgiveness and repentance. He would have made mistakes, absolutely. But he never went back to the tax collector booth because there was a turning point. Because he tasted and seen, because he said, I leave wealth, security, comfort, and I follow. Follow as a servant. He saw up close what Jesus did. That's what we're invited to, church. That's what we're invited to, to be up close with the king to pick up the mantle, to burn the plow, but pick up the mantle. It's a surrender. Burn the plow, pick up the mantle, and serve the king. It's worth burning any plow for. And I invite you, just as I had three years ago, a surrender moment. Perhaps there's been a wrestle or God's hand placed on an area of your heart that is not quite his yet. Perhaps you've come here for the first time or a few times and there needs to be a surrender to the king. Perhaps there needs to be a burning of the plow moment, a repentance moment. Perhaps there needs to be a burning of some compromises because we are an all-in people, an all-in church all in church for the kingdom. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. If this is you committing, if you could close your eyes and bow your heads. An all in surrender commitment, would you repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I surrender. I am all in and I repent, I turn away, and I'm sorry. And I believe that you died on the cross for me, taking my place and my sin, and died for me, and you rose again, giving me eternal life and relationship with you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Come and make your home in me. I burn the plows. And I'm all in, Jesus. I surrender. Amen. If we could keep our eyes closed. If you've made this commitment, this re-surrender moment, for the first time, or if you're re-surrendering, re-surrendering would you just momentarily raise your hand with me after three a physical display of a spiritual surrender of a spiritual turning if we could keep our eyes closed would you raise your hand with me a physical sign of spiritual surrender amen 
Amen. Shall we have a round of applause for all those who returned? Amen. Shall we pray, church, before we go back into worship? Father God, I thank you for your church and for your people. God, and we declare that we are all in people for the gospel, for the serving, the glory of the gospel. Kingdom come and may you be established in this church, established in every heart of every person here. God, we declare that we are a burning of the plows people, a burning of the plows to be in a place of servanthood. It's worth burning any plow for, to be the people, to be the church, to be the kingdom that is serving the king. It's worth burning any plow for, God. And Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and fill us, God? We are an all-in people, all-in for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen.